Kat, I'm a junior doctor now, but when I was 12 I had osteosarcoma, bone cancer that mostly affects young teenagers. This is Max, he's a bull mastiff. He's about nine years old now. He started going lame himself, but I just had this nagging feeling that he might have something quite wrong with him. So booked him into the local vets and I said, I, I think he might have bone cancer. It was originally um, noticed by my mother. I had a swelling on my leg and it was the summer and I was wearing shorts and we went to the GP. He sent us to get some x-rays and they diagnosed the osteosarcoma. What I said at the time was that I'd rather be the uh, first person to have the new prosthesis than uh, the last person to have the old one. He had the implant fitted and Noel said at the time, look, if you get six months out of it, you'll be lucky. So sort of 18 months down the line, we were thinking, yes, we've done it. If I'd had it just a year earlier, I'd have had a prosthesis that needed to be lengthened surgically as I grew. But when I did have it, um, I was able to have a very new uh, prosthesis, which could be lengthened by a magnet from pretty high up in my femur down to about here in the tibia. Noel looked at him and said, you know, this is an emergency. These are our options. We can either amputate his leg which on a dog of his size and weight, we just didn't think it was, it was going to be fair. Um, he said, or oh, we can euthanize him, or oh, we've got this implant, and really, that's what we were here for. If we took a cell from his osteosarcoma, from your osteosarcoma, we put them under a microscope, gave them to a pathologist at any human or animal pathology centre, they wouldn't know which was the human and which was the dog. Right. Isn't that incredible? Mm. There was a paper published by Steve Whitrow in Colorado State a few years ago, and it showed that 265 genes are identical between your osteosarcoma and Max's osteosarcoma. Right. Identical. In fact, to date, as far as I know, nobody has found a gene in human osteosarcoma that isn't in dog osteosarcoma. And if you took the whole cell population of the tumour in his leg and the whole cell population of the tumour in your leg, you're more likely to find a comparison between you and him than you are between two dogs or two humans. Right. Isn't that incredible? That is bizarre, yeah. I didn't even know osteosarcoma was something that happened in dogs, but I looked into it and um, I was reading that it's mostly dogs with long legs and like grey hands and stuff, so that's quite interesting. What's astounding is that I know that the disease is the same, but you didn't know, mm. which if you didn't know, obviously it makes sense that the entire medical community don't know. Yeah, I just don't think they think about it at all. <laughs> it's so bizarre because this technology, the bone on growth technology that you had put in your leg when you were 12, 13, is identical to what Max had put in his leg three years ago. And we have leapfrogged this implant, our initial implant for dogs was derived from your implant. But because I was seeing and treating so many more cases than they were seeing and treated, mm. we could rapidly move the technology on in dogs that really needed it. And I guess you can afford to be a little bit more experimental. Well, that's the thing. So you, uh, the word experimental is derived from about 200 years of lack of collaboration between human medicine and veterinary medicine. So in the human medical world, uh, experimented on animals to get the implants and the drugs that we need for ourselves. But that was never a two-way street, which mm. is bizarre. So, in, so in, if you take osteosarcoma, if you take osteosarcoma and inject it into an animal, any animal, you get a homogeneous cell population mm. that grows inside that animal, and then you do something with it, which is an experiment. Mm. And then you kill that animal to get your result. Mm. If, however, you look at a real animal with real osteosarcoma, that's a heterogeneous cell population, meaning it has its own stroma, and is growing in a naturally occurring environment. Therefore, it's much more like your disease mm. than a homogeneous cell population. Mm. So his disease, almost identical, if not identical to your disease. The experimental animal, not identical to your disease. Which is why, when we use drugs and implants on a real animal, it's much more valuable for your disease in terms of informing 
what next to do, whether it's an implant or a drug. Mm. Would it not make sense that if Max's mom comes to see me, we give her all the options, full amputation, radiation, drugs, death, or this. She makes a decision, which in this case is this. And if I do a hundred of these, now we don't need to kill the animal to get the result we need. In other words, we don't need to kill Max to learn what Max has to tell us. Mm. And what Max has to tell us, we can interrogate with a CT scan nowadays in 2017 to look at that interface. But before now, even a decade ago, we couldn't do that. And that's the game changer. Neither during my treatment or my medical training had I come across the concept of one medicine. Um, I think we find it very easy to think about transferring knowledge from uh, animal models to humans, but we don't ever really consider the possibility of working back the other way. One of my life's mission is to get cancer drugs into dogs with real disease that are not bred to experiment on and then killed, and humans with real disease that are not bred to experiment on and actually move forward together. And out there right now in the research world, there's over 6,000 potential drug candidates for human use. But we can't get them into real dogs with real disease because we can't get a license to do it. You had cisplatin, yeah. which probably saved your life. We could develop a better drug. I'm convinced we can. So if that next generation of drug proves more effective than cisplatin in the laboratory, give it to 100 dog families that really need it at a reduced price, and we will give you your data over the next two, three years. Then you know, does it have toxic side effects? Is it going to prolong life? Does it work in real life? And given that his cancer is almost identical, if not identical to yours, that is real data. That's not experimental data. That is animal model data. And that's what I'm trying to compel the MHRA and all regulation bodies, including the pharmaceutical industry and the implant industry, to listen to that message. But they won't because there's not enough money in it to make them listen. Mm. And the conventional big pot of money comes from launching a drug that's going to make hundreds of millions globally. Whereas I could make them the same amount of money for less cost, with less sacrifice of life, if they give us access to the drugs earlier. Obviously, we're heavily reliant on animal models, so any interaction between the two can only benefit human medicine. Um, it'd be brilliant if it worked the other way as well. The big excuse is, oh, but you're doing an experiment on a dog that is in a family. Well, I guarantee you, if you speak to Max's mum, she would say otherwise. No, Noel has given me all the options for Max, and I'm gonna choose, with all of the options on the table, whether I use the conventional drug or a new drug, whether I use the conventional limb amputation or a new endoprosthesis, and in fact, whether I put Max to sleep. That's my decision. A few years ago, I'd worked in orthopedic research and been through quite a few implants myself, and I wasn't sure whether it could be even done, to be honest, I'd never seen it. So when Noel first brought out the implant and I looked at it, I thought, gosh, that, that is a feat of engineering. It really is. I was astonished how robust it was and the fact that it was going to fit him and the fact that it could just create a bridge between the bones where the cancer had eroded his bone. It was quite astonishing, really. And now here he is, pain-free, not limping, running around, jumping in and out of the car. It's, it's phenomenal and we are incredibly grateful. So you can either treat a hundred dogs and kill them or you can treat a hundred clinical dogs that really need it and don't kill them. Mm. But the implant companies don't want to listen to that model because there's no finite end point to their experiment. In other words, the dog's death is the finite end point. And what I'm trying to say to people is you don't need a finite end point. You need an adjudication end point, an examination end point, an end point which provides acceptable evidence for the human model. So we have an animal model and a human model coming together, actually with technology that's available now and for the first time now, to interrogate this model and you, because nobody would think of killing you to learn what's in your leg. 
Yeah, and um, with Max, I mean, by having him living with his prosthesis for some time, you've been able to see complications that I've experienced myself, which you wouldn't get if you had an endpoint experiment. Correct. Either. And if you were a human orthopedic surgeon and I said to you, I can give you a much more effective implant than what you're using at the moment, I can make it last longer and I can prolong the life of your patient with that implant, you would absolutely listen, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I'm not interested in money, ego, power and glory. It has no interest for me. What interests me is Max and Max's quality of life. Today might change everything. I hope so. Well, no, I believe it can. I genuinely believe that you and me meeting with Max could change everything if people just watch, listen and choose for a moment to reflect that what we're actually talking about really matters to human beings and animals everywhere across human medicine, across veterinary medicine. Because this kind of technology that's in you and that's in Max absolutely will immeasurably enhance life.